Welcome back. This is Lecture 3, Part 1. And now we're going to get into a section as we introduce the New Testament called the Synoptic Problem. The Synoptic Problem, the Gospels and the Synoptic Problem. So what we're going to work with is a theme, and here's the theme that we start out with. And that is Christians before the 18th century entertained few doubts that the Gospels were to be read as historically reliable accounts of the life of Jesus, the main problem to be faced was that of harmonization. In other words, the biggest problem that the Christians had was harmonizing the Gospels and harmonizing, okay, how they came together and how the stories were interrelated with one another. And it was great difficulty. And so what I want to enter with you is a discussion about the Gospels and the synoptic problems. Perhaps at the moment you don't see it as an important issue, but eventually it does become an important issue uh, in the life of many believers. Now, I've had the opportunity as well as the privilege to pastor for now 30 years. And one of the things that I've discovered along the road is that eventually I do get enough Christians who begin to ask me enough questions about why this does, why this account does not relate to this other account exactly the way Matthew said it, as opposed to Mark, or as opposed to John, or as opposed to Luke. And these questions become questions that really fester and bother people. And so I want to address that issue as we begin to unfold and unpack the New Testament. And before I do that, I want to remind everybody about your reading schedules once again. You should be by this stage on page 103 to page 127 in Dr. Carson's book, and you should be at pages 62 to 78 in Dr. Benware's book in your reading. Keep up with your reading. I do not cover a lot of the materials that are in the actual text themselves because I believe that the authors have done an excellent job in taking care of the subject matter that is at hand. However, if you're going to keep up with the course, you need to stay in, you need to stay on top of your reading because not only do you have your textbook readings, but you have a lot of handouts that you receive in this particular class and in any of my classes that you take, you know that I, I, I have lots of handouts and you are required and will be held accountable and responsible for the information there. So we're going to be working with this concept called the Gospels and the Synoptic Problems. And we're faced with a number of issues. So let me, let me start out with saying to you that the synoptic problem, okay, is not really a problem uh, in the normal sense of the term that we, how we will use problem, okay? It is a simple way to refer to the questions and the possible explanations about the literary relationships between the first three New Testament Gospels. Now, if you recall the word synoptic, okay, it means seen together, seen together or with the same eye, seen with the same eye. Matthew, Mark, and Luke present okay, the basic story of Jesus in similar ways, including the order of the material, the stories told, the sayings of Jesus, even using many of the same words in parallel accounts. For this reason, they are called the Synoptic Gospels. On the other hand, while the Gospel of John sometimes, I'm saying sometimes resembles the other three Gospels, it tells the story of Jesus in significantly different ways, including a different order of events, different perspectives and points of emphasis, and with its own unique vocabulary and style. Those differences can be understood in terms other than literary relationships between the Gospels, which is the reason John is not included in the synoptic problem. So what we do understand clearly right from the outset that as we go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or as we had it in the order that we were using it in the other classes, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, um, what I want you to understand is that you have different accounts of the same account. You heard what I just said? You have a different way of the same event is being reported to us in, different, in a different chronological pattern, um, different details. Some details are added, some details are omitted. 
Okay, some the chronology, the timeline could be at the outset of entering a city, and another gospel were reported as they left the city, so forth and so forth. So we have a number of issues that come up, and what we're going to do, as we did in the other class, we're going to work through some of these issues, and I'm just going to pick out a few examples, and over the next few classes, and then we're just going to walk through it. And what you're going to need to do is you need your Bibles, so spread yourself out, and and you're going to have to just run quickly with me, because uh, what we're going to do is we're going to compare three gospel passages together. Is what we're going to be doing, and so I want you to understand that, so you get an understanding for what happens when a brand new born again person, a baby Christian, comes into the faith, and now they sit there and they read the gospels. And they are confused as they read through the Gospels because they go, well, I thought I read this story in here, and I thought I read it over there, but it says a little bit different over there, and it says a little bit different over there, and I've got more details over here, and it just states it as a fact over here. And what happens is they have lots and lots of questions. So one of the issues that happens in practically any and almost all churches is that baby Christians are left squandering on their own with lots and lots of questions. And in fact, many times they don't even know what questions to ask. They just find themselves in a state of flux with regard to all of the various patterns that unfold inside the Synoptic Gospels. To someone who has never studied the Gospels solely, or very closely, or who has assumed certain logically constructed theories about the nature of Scripture apart from looking at the actual biblical text, for example, the absolute inerrancy of Scripture, questions about the literary relationship between the Gospels may be unnerving at first. It is, easy, it, it is easy simply to reject them as much scholarly speculation and academic conjecture. It's really easy to do that. Uh, yet these questions arise from the biblical text itself. Questions obvious to most anyone who takes the time to examine the biblical text closely. I can recall, and I do remember when I was in seminary taking classes at the very beginning, um, um, I'm not sure exactly what it was it that drew me to the issue as much as I do recall that the issue was presented and it did leave me a bit perplexed when the professor um, made a statement and said, well, the synoptic problem is a synoptic problem that's, un that's unresolvable and thus you're just going to have to accept it the way it is. And I just sat there thinking to myself, well, what is the synoptic problem? <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know what the synoptic problem was. Uh, I had lots of questions as to why there were great differences in, in the Gospels. Uh, didn't know that it was called the synoptic problem. And as we sat there and soon discovered that I had all the, these other men around me who were pastors and pastoring churches as well and so forth. And, and, and the break, during the break times, during the coffee break time or the lunch or whatever it was, uh, this great discussion ensued uh, among all of the pastor students uh, with regard to why all these differences existed and I was amazed to hear all the theories that came out of this. Well, that provoked me to really look, sit down, and in those days, remember, um, we didn't have a lot of computers, we didn't have the technology that we have today, and so I was infamous and well known for my yellow pads, you know, I just have all these yellow pads, and um, and on this occasion, I had a legal size yellow pad, and I just threw three lines, three lines down, and I made three columns, and I just began to look at the scriptures and literally began to write out by hand. Um, you have to remember, we didn't have laptop computers. In fact, I didn't even have a desktop computer. I didn't even have that in back in those days. Um, and and so we just wrote everything out and began to compare the scriptures and why. Why was it that these issues came up and why was it written, why was the different accounts written the way they were written? And what it did, it caused me to wind up taking, uh, I eventually wound up taking six different classes on the Gospels and I was amazed to see six different professors um, just perplex themselves with regard to the Gospels. Uh, so this is what really provoked me on this, uh, on this pursuit of trying to understand the Gospels and the synoptic problem.
And I'm not sure that I'm going to be of any assistance to you in this. However, I am going to present the problem and some of the issues that are involved, and perhaps we may never have some solutions to it, but you need to be aware that they do exist because we have so many new believers coming into the kingdom of God, coming into the church of the living God, and they have questions when they begin to read the Gospels, especially if they get into Sunday school class. Somebody's going to have to explain these issues to them because they, they have very real questions. So I want you to understand them. Now, if we are honestly to hear and understand Scripture on its own terms, we will have to come to terms with the issue in ways that go beyond simply denying that there is any issue because of a certain theology or ideology about Scripture. On the other hand, we need honestly to concede at the very beginning that there is no final answer to the quote-unquote problem. There are various perspectives, hypotheses, and theories based on the evidence of the biblical text, as well as what we know about the process of writing, but there is not a correct answer. That simply suggests that while we need to take this issue seriously as part of what we see in the biblical text as we have it, it is not a matter of faith one way or the other. Rather, it is simply being honest with the biblical text and not trying to make it say or, for, or make it say or be what it is not. It is also acknowledging that, we, acknowledging that we do not have to have all of the answers to our logical questions before we can accept the Bible as scripture for the church. I am settled on that issue. I never questioned whether or not the Bible was a scripture for the church. Never questioned that. This issue is not a matter of believing or not believing in the Bible. It is a matter of believing and then seeking to understand as best as we can that which we believe, faith seeking understanding. And so what I want to do is to encourage you to maintain your faith high, not to dissuade you from your faith, but that we will use our faith to understand. Someone might ask, why should we bother with the issue if there is no correct solution to the problem? That is not, the, that, that is not, is, that is not an essential matter of Christian faith. Here we return to a simple principle that grew out of the Protestant Reformation, the principle of sola scriptura, only scripture, only scripture. Now this principle, as one of the cornerstones of the Reformation, held that scripture should be the first and final authority for the faith and practice of the church, and that it should be allowed to stand in judgment over all human creeds, doctrines, and traditions. And so I am convinced that the Word of God must transcend all of that. I was in a situation where, when I was in seminary, we had pastors from all kinds of distinct denominations and many independent churches. So we had all kinds of people from all kinds of walks. And one of the things that became very clear to me, and I didn't get caught up in the denominational arguments, and I didn't get caught up in the denominational milieu, cultural milieu, if you will, or the denominational philosophical, um, uh, politically correct uh, positions. I had so many colleagues of mine from so many different kinds of churches and backgrounds and so it turned out to be one of the most exciting experiences for this reason and that I was hearing all kinds of interpretations and versions and theories and philosophies and so forth and so forth. And yet the one thing that remained common through all of that was that our faith, our practice was to be governed by scripture not by our creeds, doctrines, and traditions. And that pretty much solidified it for me. As that principle worked out in the history of the church in the centuries following the Reformation, it meant a rigorous honesty with how scripture was to be studied. The goal was to hear the Bible as scripture for the church, neither in isolation from the traditions of faith, nor, nor should they be captive to them. This allowed the development of critical methodologies for the investigation of Scripture, 
that included a careful and detailed reading of the biblical text for what they actually said from the doctrines that told people what they should mean. This did not deny the authority of the Bible as the inspired word of God. In fact, it affirmed it even more strongly. But it did allow the biblical text to be seen as something more than a repository of timeless and unchanging truths written by the finger of God. <coughs> Excuse me. While not always as successful in, ob in, objectively, um, in objectivity as envisioned, these critical methods allow the tremendous diversity of the biblical text to emerge, a diversity that had been masked for many centuries by the dogmatic and doctrinal approaches that sought to harmonize any differences in the biblical text. The rich texture of the biblical tradition has emerged as the witnesses of various communities of faith over many centuries to God's self-revelation in the history came to light. And we'll discuss this much later in a handout that I'll have for you entitled Revelation and Inspiration of Scripture. And perhaps if we have time, we will study that, later. We will study that in the classroom or I'll give it out to you as a handout. Like any elegant tapestry, the Bible could be viewed on a broad scale uh, as a marvelous record of God's dealing with humanity. It is the story of God in a striking panorama. Yet on closer inspection, the tremendous complexity of the fabric and the threads that created the larger picture could now be seen. Biblical study then turned to a careful examination of these strands as a way to help understand the larger picture. Do not cease, I beg of you, do not cease to be awed, awed by God's divine word. Let us not be so technically oriented, even though we go through a technical section here in these next few classes, that we forget the awesomeness the divine majestic presence of God himself in his word as he speaks to us today. So an understanding of the synoptic problem is a crucial first step in any detailed study of the Gospels and their testimony to Jesus Christ simply because it allows us to begin with the witness of the biblical text itself. Do not forget that what happens is that the Gospels, or at least the way the Bible has been formatted for us today, as we have it laid out for us today, um, the Gospels become the gateway into the New Testament. That will not assure a student of the New Testament that everything she or he or con concludes will be unbiased and objective. It's not going to assure you of that. But it will encourage us to listen to the text, to take it seriously even in all of its diversity, and will constantly warn us against a too easy and perhaps unconscious manipulation of the scripture from any theological agenda. I do not have a theological agenda with regard to this issue. So we're going to tackle this issue and look at it for face value for what it is without getting caught up in denominational politics or philosophies. The problem, let's look at this problem. This is not the Gospels. What happens? It shares a great deal of materials and features. There are differences between them in many, many areas, some more profound than others. Yet all of the questions about the differences arise precisely because of the otherwise close parallels between the synoptics. And I am convinced that the problem of the problem, if you will, is not the differences, but the parallelisms that exist between them, which is what causes us this great angst in these questions to arise. While we might be able to answer some of these questions about the differences mm -hmm, as a matter of context, a matter of culture, a matter of personality or purpose, the parallels are not as easily explained. And I think that's, that, I think that's one of the hinges this issue turns on. 
the questions that arise about the literary relationships that we have between the Synoptic and the Gospels concern both the differences, you need to understand that, both the differences as well as the similarities. This is what causes the confusion for people. Although the similarities rarely focus on the questions, it's almost always focusing on the differences. So, the synoptic problem is a way that serious students of the Gospels attempt to understand the origins and the interrelationships of the first three Gospels that would explain both the similarities and the differences between them. What causes us to ask the questions are the differences, but what provokes us is the similarities. Because we're, we're bothered by the issue, it's, we had the same story in three Gospels, why is it told differently? So you see, it's the similarities that provokes us to notice the differences. So the synoptic problem really is not the differences, but it's the similarities that we cannot reconcile from the perspective that each author of the three Gospels presents the same story to us. And so that bothers us. And, and that's the reason why I told you at the outset that the theme that we're working with in this particular section of our study is that Christians before the 18th century um, entertained very few doubts uh, that the Gospels were to be read as historical, historically reliable accounts of the life of Jesus. That was not an issue. In fact, it was never an issue. If you go back and you look at it from, from the first century, work your way in through this, particularly the first, the second and third centuries and the fourth century, which were the most volatile period there. And then after the fourth century, you go into what we would call in church history, the dark ages, the dark period, all the way through up into the 14th century into the 15th century, and then we get into the, uh, the beginning of the Reformation and into the half, second half of the 15th century, into the 16th and 17th century, and then we get into the Enlightenment, the 18th century, even in the Enlightenment, even in the Enlightenment, which is where we get the birth of all the universities and the colleges around the world, and pe pe then people began to question the, the scriptures, whether or not it was relevant, it was even, even the Word of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and this was in the seminary never mind the secular institutions, um, uh, that even then was not the issue. Okay? It's, it's quite ironic that is when we get into the 20th century, all of us said, voila, we are so intelligent, so much smarter than God, that we began to question the veracity of the Gospels. Or, as the president of our seminary has once told me, well, on a number of occasions in different meetings, he said some folks are just uh, educated beyond their level of intelligence. Welcome back. This is Lecture 3, Part 2. Now, I need you to open your Bibles, and we're going to run between the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I got three sets of scriptures. We're going to compare them so you get a grasp of what we're talking about in the similarities and the differences that exist in attempting to harmonize the synoptic gospels. And let's begin to look at this. We're going to work through this text here as an example. So I've just picked out some text. And I want you to see this with me as we go through this class. Now, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. Then we're going to look at Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And then we're also going to look at Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. Let's just kind of work through that, through those texts there. Um, either you have three Bibles or you have a parallel Bible. Um, or you have um, uh, a lot of desk space <laughs> to lay out three full Bibles out in front of you, or you have your laptops or your tablets, and you can bring up uh, uh, and you can bring up on your screen the uh, the text. 
So we're going to put them. So I'm going to put the first column, we're going to put Matthew. The second one, we're going to put Mark. And the, second, and the third one, we're going to put Luke. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And then let's place in the third column, we're going to look at Luke chapter 5, verse 27 to 32. Now, there are places in the Synoptic Gospels are closely parallel in the recounting of the incidents from the life of Jesus. Now, while there may be minor differences in these cases, the accounts are basically the same. So, for example, in the account, uh, let's look at Levi, okay, who we know as Matthew. <clears throat> so, what we're going to do is look at some of the similarities, just to show you that, because you need to understand it, because then when we look at the other ones, you'll see what we're talking about. So, if we were to look at Matthew chapter 9, Mark chapter 2, Luke chapter 5, and we'll look at, let's just read through very quickly Matthew, and then very quickly Mark, and then very quickly Luke, and then we're going to go back and look at it verse by verse. Are we together? You follow me? Yeah, let's go. Let's look at that. So now, we're going to be looking at the account of the calling of Levi, the account of calling of Matthew. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, as Jesus was walking along, right, but if you look at, and he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. That was verse 10, verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? Verse 12, but when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. And verse 13 he says, go and learn that what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous but the sinners. Then we look at Mark chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. Jesus went out again and beside the sea, and the whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught him. Now we begin to see the similarity here in verse 14. He says, and as he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now look at verse 16. We see the similarities again. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating in the sinners and the tax collectors, why, they said to the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Again, Verse 17, very similar to verse 12 of Matthew, when Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. Now, let's look at Luke. In Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27 down to verse 32, look at this. After this, he went out, and he saw a tax collector named sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. So here again, we see verse 27, very similar to verse 14 of Mark, very similar to verse 9 of Matthew. And then in verse 28, and he got up and left everything and followed him. We see that, okay, that flows. So it took two verses in Luke to say what one verse was saying in Mark and one in, in Matthew. Then in verse 29, Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in the house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. So we see the similarity here in verse 29 of Luke, verse 15 of Mark, as well as verse 10 of Matthew. And it says, and they were complaining, and then in verse 30 says, And the Pharisees and the scribes, they were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So we see the similarity in Luke 30, okay, Luke uh, 530, along with Mark 216 and Matthew 911. Then in verse 31, and Jesus answered, he said this, Who are well, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So here we have a similarity of Luke 531 along with Mark uh, 217 and Matthew 912, okay? And so then he says here, and then in verse 32, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repent. So we see that there's a similarity here, uh, very clearly here, uh, between verse 32 of Luke chapter 5, uh, along with verse 17, uh, the second half of verse 17 of Mark 2, and as well as now Matthew 9, 13. So as we put them together side by side, we can clearly see the similarities, okay? Okay. 
Right? We can see that. However, but yet. Yet, this similarity raises a number of questions. Now, perhaps you have not thought of these questions. Perhaps this has not provoked you, and perhaps it has not bothered you. But since you are in a seminary class, okay, uh, it's our job to trouble you, okay? And that's what we're going to be doing here this morning. So I want you to see this with me. Because these are issues that have been raised, and it has, uh, and, and it has with time infiltrated the pulpits, and it's, and it's reflected in how many teachers and preachers of the Word of God present the Gospels. So here's the first question. I have a number of questions. We have at least, what, six, seven, eight, nine questions. So here's a series of questions. All right? Yet these similarities that we just finished reading here, okay, in, in Matthew chapter 9, in Mark chapter 2, in Luke chapter 5, okay, okay, raise all kinds of questions. For example, number one, how can we explain these very close parallels between the Synoptic Gospels, especially considering that the Gospels were likely written in different places at different times? You, you, you recall in our theme that we were working with in the whole series of Lecture 2, do you remember that, that theme that we talked about? And we said that each gospel was likely, okay, written for a different community of faith at a different time, at a different location, to bring the gospel witness to bear on the needs of that particular community. Remember, that was the theme that we were working with in, during the, lecture, in the series of Lecture 2. And so that issue, okay, now raises questions. If that is true, then how is it they can be similar? Well, then we get the second question, okay? Were they using a common written source or shared tradition in their writing? In other words, is there a third external source outside of them that they want to, they went to, they referenced to, and they copied? Number three, did there exist a record of Jesus that was earlier than the Gospels that all the writers used in producing their own Gospels? So in other words, is there a pre-Gospel to the Gospels? Number four, if so, why were the Gospels themselves written if they already existed in early account? Now you begin to see this, the, the, the questions. If Number five, if either written if either written sources or oral tradition were used in the compilation in the compilation of the Gospels, were those sources reliable? Number six, would the sources have to be inspired in order for the Gospels to be inspired? Number seven, and exactly how were the sources used? Number eight, were the gospel writers simply trying faithfully to reproduce those sources that they were referencing to? Number nine, or did the gospel writers feel free to interpret and apply the Jesus traditions as they wrote their gospels? So you can see that these are the questions that lie at the heart of the synoptic problem. Now do you understand the synoptic problem? Because this has infiltrated, this has impacted Many of the seminaries and Bible colleges and universities in the presentation of the Gospels as we start out studying the New Testament. So if we have this <coughs> mamungus, if I can use that word, <coughs> as one of my grandchildren said, mamungus, okay, okay, he said mamungus, and we can use that. <clears throat> and that word there very clearly, okay? we have this mamungus problem now at the outset of studying the New Testament. We can't even get past the Gospels in the New Testament, and already we have nine major questions, at least that we've identified for the purposes of this class, <clears throat> but it's over a hundred other questions, which has caused a great deal of angst in colleges and universities, and depending on where you get your education, depending on where you have studied, okay, this issue does come up repeatedly, and if you think it only happens in a seminary class at some institution of higher learning in academia, you are sadly mistaken. It does not. I have done enough Bible conferences where I've taught at. 
in Bible conferences in different locations around the world, as I've told you, uh, I've had the opportunity, the great privilege, and by the and all everything is by the grace of God, everything by the grace of God, to teach in a lot of different settings on the different many cultures and languages. And one of the I'm always amazed how this issue comes up because they heard it from some preacher on some radio okay, or an internet program that they downloaded or somebody's book or lecture series or sermon series okay, and this issue comes up and it has impacted people's faith and not only that but it has propagated the issue well the Bible is just a book written by man so I really don't have to believe in it so we're going to have to settle this issue now do you see why I chose to enter the New Testament this way? Because if you can't get past these issues, then you, you, you've got to, you're going to have some real problems with regard to mm -hmm. Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Do you follow me? All the way to Revelation. So I want you to understand that with me. Now, we haven't got to Matthew yet. We, we've just been talking about the Seminatic Gospels. Because this is an issue that has come up so many times, we're going to have to find addresses, we're going to have to face this head on. Yet, as similar as they are, there are still differences between the Gospels on many levels. Even in these very similar passages that we just read together here in Matthew 9, Mark 2, Luke 5, okay, uh, there are minor differences of word order, words used, syntax and style of writing and grammatical variations. There are also differences in other details between the Gospels, some of which can be seen above and which we have just seen and we have seen right now in, in the Gospels here. Okay? Sometimes names are included or, or omitted uh, or are given in different forms as in the illustration where Matthew is called Levi in the book of, uh, 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 Matthew is called Levi, okay, in Mark and in Luke, okay, we, we, we see that sometimes, because we, we see that, right, because if you remember that, we, when we were looking at that in, um, in Mark chapter 2, in verse 14, and as he was walking along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, in Luke chapter 5, verse 27, uh, after this he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. But in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, it says, and he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. So even, so immediately we have some differences that begin to pop up, okay? And I've actually heard this. I, 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 look, I don't put anything past uh, what preachers do on radio. I, I, I've learned that um, sometimes I'm just aghast and I'm left without words, if, 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 if I can put it that way. <clears throat> now, if you don't know, I, right, I, we're right now, um, uh, I pastor a church in the city of Los Angeles, in, in California, on the west coast of the United States, and I'm in a city of several million people, so it's a very large cosmopolitan area. In fact, the southern region when I am, where I'm located is about 18 million people in the whole southern region, and so we have thousands of churches, thousands of churches and radio stations and so forth, um, and so you get a chance to hear all kinds of preachers on the radio. And I am always amazed at what people say on the radio, particularly in Christian radio. And this is probably the, the fault line that I find um, in, in, the, in the Christian media of communication is that no one holds anybody accountable to the things that they say on radio, much less Christian television. Christian television, Christian radio, much of it is, is I, it just it leaves me uh, spinning because you can say anything in the name of Jesus and no one questions you. No one holds you accountable to the things that you say. So I'll give you an example. I, I walk a lot uh, for health purposes, you know, and I, um, I've had a full knee replacement and so I, I, I've got to walk, I've got to keep active and, um, and I can tell you, I have a, and so I listen to early morning radio. I'm walking, I put on my little earbuds, you know, and I put them on and I got my little iPod on and I locate my local radio station or I'll use one, my smartphone, you know, I plug it in and I'll, 
and I'll locate my local radio station there. Or if not, then I'll listen to a download a sermon or a teaching from somewhere. But as I'm walking along in the early morning hours, I'm always amazed at the things that I hear. And on this one occasion, I'm walking along, and the preacher's talking about how Matthew, okay, who was called Matthew in Matthew chapter 9, uh, was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He's one of the 12. And then he made the following declaration. I do recall this. You know, I was just about to flip as I was crossing the street, almost got hit by a car because I was just like screaming at myself. Uh, you know, I was screaming at him. He couldn't hear me. You know? So that ought to tell you who was the idiot here. It wasn't him. It was me. I'm in the middle of the street. And I'm going, what? What are you talking about? And he says, he says, well, you know, Levi in Mark, in Mark chapter 2 and Levi in, Mark chapter, in, in, in uh, Luke chapter 5, he says he was not a disciple. He was not uh, one of the disciples because, you see, it was only Matthew, the Matthew that's found in chapter 9. And, and I, just, I was just st stunned by what the statement that he made. And later on, remember, during the day, I called the radio station. And I said, you know, the, pre the preacher said this, 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 thing. Well, yeah, 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 we know. He says, but that, but that was not accurate. And, and, and the station manager said, well, yeah, but we don't govern what people say. So basically, much of Christian radio is as long as you have the money to pay, you can just about say anything you want. And so, and I'm thinking to myself, there's millions of people in the audience listening to this. And how accurate can that be? So I want you to see how, can you see the practicality of the synoptic problem? Can you see that now? So here in Matthew 9, it mentions, in Matthew 9, 9, it mentions um, Matthew as the tax collector. In Mark 2, 13, 14, it mentions Levi as the tax collector. And in Matthew 5, 27, it mentions Levi as the tax collector. And yet you have a preacher on radio saying that Matthew is the only disciple of the original 12, but Levi that's mentioned in Mark 2 and Levi is mentioned in Luke 5, he's not a disciple. Now do you see the synoptic problem? Just because he's used, a different name is used for him. Uh, let me ask you something. So if you had, let's say you had, your name is John, John Taylor Smith. I, don't, I just picked that out of the air, okay? Um, and so if I decided to call you John, you're still the same person, right? But let's say I decided to call you John Taylor. Are you the same person? Yes. Well, what if I decided to call you Taylor Smith? Are you the same person? Or, I, or maybe I just decided to call you Taylor. Are you the same person? Yes, I think that's pretty obvious, right? We wouldn't argue that. However, so here I'm walking along and I'm listening to this preacher early radio program and he makes his declaration and he says that, that he can prove that Matthew's the only disciple, and I don't even know why he got on that tangent, but because he says in Mark chapter 2 it talks about Levi, in, Mark chap in Luke chapter 5 talks about Levi, and I want you to understand that the only guy who's a true disciple is Matthew in Matthew chapter 9. That's why we raise the issue of the synoptic problem. Something that simple. And I'm thinking, millions of people listening to him on the radio. And he makes this statement. So late in the afternoon, as I, tell, I told you, I called the radio station and I asked him, I said, do you know how inaccurate that was? And he says, yeah, he says, but we don't, we don't hold anybody accountable because we have no committee that oversees what preachers say on radio, much less on television. Now do you see the practicality of the synoptic problem? So how many Christians are running around going, oh, well, Levi's insignificant in Mark chapter 2, Levi's insignificant in Luke chapter 5, because, you know, he wasn't a disciple, so we don't have to listen to anything he had to say. Really? That's something that simple. That's why we're tackling, on, we're tackling head on this issue of the synoptic problem. So... In every similar, and, and, and so I want you to see that with me. So yet as similar as they are, there are still differences between the Gospels on many levels. Even in these very similar passages, there are minor differences of word order, uh, word use, syntax, a style of writing, grammatical variations. There are also differences in other details between the Gospels, of some of which are, can be seen okay, in the text that we just read, for example, in Matthew 9, Mark 2, Luke 5. Um, sometimes names are included and sometimes they're omitted. Sometimes they're changed or sometimes they're in different forms, as in the illustration that we showed you in Matthew. In Matthew, he's Matthew. In, in Mark and Luke, he's called Levi. Sometimes additional details are added in one account, such as quotations from Hosea is added in Matthew's version. For example, if you go back to Matthew's version, okay, um, 
in, in Matthew 9, remember, I, I should keep the three texts in front of you. So we have Matthew 9, 13. So in Matthew 9, 13, let me, let, let me show you this, okay? He says, but go on to where, he says, and, and now he says, look at this, the, he goes, he, he goes, here's the, here's the additional detail, and he, now he quotes the Old Testament, Hosea. He says, but go and learn, this means I desire compassion and sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. You go, well, so what's the big deal? Okay, well, Matthew uses Matthew to quote Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. He's quoting the Old Testament, where it says, for I delight in the loyalty rather than sacrifice and the knowledge of God rather than the burnt offerings. He uses that, right? We see that, which is, we, we see that very clear. But Mark and Luke does not add that information of the same account of what took place. Then we see, in addition to that, and sometimes the saying of Jesus is recorded in Aramaic while the parallel passage is recorded, is recorded in Hebrew. For example, in Jesus' quotation of Psalm 22, 1, right? So if we were looked at, for example, we, we, we see in Matthew 27, 46, where Jesus makes, he says this, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, or Ali, Ali would be the proper pronunciation in Hebrew, Ali, Ali. He says, Labasabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that's actually written out in Hebrew. However, if you go to Mark 15, 34, which is the same parallel passage, it's not written in Hebrew, it's written in Arabic. Okay? And so it would say, at that ninth hour, Jesus cried out and said, Eli, Eli, which is different from Ali, Ali. Eloi, Eloi. Okay? It will be Eloi, Eloi. So sometimes we see the differences between the Hebrew text, the Aramaic text, and the Greek text. 